Okay, so uh, thank you very much and uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending where in the world you are joining us today. Um, uh, welcome all to the uh, fifth uh, East West workshop on industrial archaeology. Uh, my name is uh, Juan Manuel Cano Sanchez. Um, I'm from uh, the Institute for Cultural Heritage of uh, uh, History of Science and Technology of the University of Science and Technology Beijing in China. And also I do belong to the Association for Industrial Archaeology. So this activity, as uh, most of you already know, is uh, jointly organized by these two institutions. And uh, well, we are now in the fifth uh, edition of this series of workshops in which uh, we focus on the materiality of the industrial past. As an association for industrial archaeology, uh, normally we give more prominence to archaeological approaches to the industrial, to the materiality of the industrial past. Even though we do this with plenty of uh, disciplinary flexibility, uh, flexibility that has always been part of uh, industrial archaeology. As a matter of fact, uh, in this edition, uh, we are not uh, counting on any archaeologist for the presentations uh, for the first time in the history of this a series of workshops uh, today, uh, rather than uh, presentations by archaeologists, uh, we are going to see how architects, uh, technology historians, and content producers uh, work with uh, the materiality of the industrial past, more, specific, more specifically with uh, architecture from the industrial past. So beyond these uh, disciplinary, multidisciplinary exchanges, uh, the goal, the aim of this series of workshops is to share ideas, to exchange ideas uh, between the West, the East, and other parts of the world. In the past, you may remember, we have had also uh, one contributor from, from Brazil. Today, uh, we are going to focus, as you know, on the architecture of the industrial society and on how the post-industrial society transformed and reused such uh, architecture. To do so, we are going to travel first to Spain, later to China, to Beijing, and finally to England and Greece, to uh, discuss uh, different approaches uh, from the point of view of uh, architectural heritage, history of architecture, uh, but also more creative, uh, more sensorial approaches to the study and presentation of the architecture from the industrial past. Mm -hmm. I will not extend this introduction any further because I'm sure that everybody is willing to, uh, is looking forward to listening to the presentations, just a pair of practical uh, comments, practical information. Uh, please, during the presentations, uh, keep your cameras and your microphone off so we can focus on the presentations and the presenters. Uh, at the end of the three presentations, uh, we are going to have a question and answer discussion section in which uh, you are very welcome to open your camera and to use your microphone if you want to. In the meantime, please uh, feel free to use the chat facility to uh, share any ideas, comments or questions that you may have. Also, uh, for those whose uh, first language is not uh, English, uh, as it is my case, obviously, uh, captions are available. Uh, so you can check uh, on the bottom, uh, the menu of the Zoom software, that you can activate the uh, captions in English. So maybe it is easier uh, to read rather than to listen. Also, if there is somebody with hurting difficulties, uh, joining us today. So thank you very much to all of you for joining today. Thanks to the speakers particularly, and also to Bill for taking care of all the uh, technical part and also 
to all the different institutions that have helped with the publicity, the organization and publicity of this workshop. I'm going now, we are going now to move to the first uh, presentation. For that, uh, for that uh, we are lucky today to count on Dr. Carolina Castañeda from Spain, who has a PhD in architecture that was granted by uh, the Program on Conservation and Restoration of Architectural Heritage of the Technical University of Madrid, UPM, by the uh, Spanish uh, name. And also she completed her training uh, in Northern Spain in the University of A Coruña and uh, in Italy, the University of Ferrara. Uh, Carolina has a double profile as an architect. Uh, now she's currently uh, working in the public sector, uh, but before this, she was a, freelance, a freelancer working in the field of uh, cultural heritage. And as a researcher, Carolina is a very active one. I, I was lucky enough to meet her for the first time uh, in Cuba, in Havana, in the Latin America uh, meeting of the Tiki. I think it was 2015 or 2016. And, and already then she was uh, very active, very participative. And now she's a board member of Tiki International and also the secretary general of Tiki Spain. Besides, she belongs to other institutions, such as, uh, well, she's also a board member of uh, INCUNA, Industry, Culture and Nature, an association from, uh, of industrial heritage from Spain that perhaps many of you already know, because INCUNA uh, organized this very uh, famous international conferences on industrial heritage every September. This year was the number 25th. And she's also an advice, is also a member of the advisory committee of uh, the management and intervention in the heritage of architecture and industry of the uh, Technical University of Madrid. Today, she's going to talk to us about the imprint of the Spanish tobacco industry on the urban landscape using cases from Spain. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Carolina, for, for your presentation today. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Juan Manuel. Uh, well, I'm going to share uh, my presentation. Um, let me know if what you're seeing is the presentation, just the presentation. Yeah, yeah, it's working good. OK, OK, thank you, Juan Manuel. So uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank um, the Association of Industrial Archaeology uh, for this invitation. I'm very pleased and um, it's uh, really exciting uh, for me to, to share um, ideas um, and my work with uh, the fellow uh, archaeologists, um, archaeologists colleagues. And also a special thank you to, to Juan Manuel, of course, that contacted me. And I was, it was uh, 2016, the Cuban conference. So it was a really great uh, event. And um, I also want to apologize in advance because I have a seven week old daughter. So that is draining my life out <laughs> and I'm, uh, a little tired uh, today, so um, I want to apologize if uh, my presentation is um, a little bit uh, funny or fuzzy, <laughs> but it's okay. And uh, maybe you uh, are going to hear some crying, um, strange sounds uh, in the back, but it's okay. So um, first of all, I want to. Uh, it's it's curious that uh, Juan Manuel was uh, talking about uh, architecture and um, my presentation is going to be about architecture, but uh, um, also all the things that um, I'm I'm integrating on my research uh, to in order to read the architecture and how my methodology uh, is based on uh, reading the building, but um, also considering um, many elements that uh, are related to the building, but uh, go beyond 
the 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 building it, itself, the architecture, and this is very important in um, the presentation and the research I'm going to um, to talk to you about, uh, because um, I think that uh, in, in, even in industrial um, heritage. Uh, when we architects uh, study uh, the buildings, the factories, the uh, many uh, um, elements that um, uh, are part of, of an industrial uh, complex, an industrial facility, we have also to think about uh, these buildings as, as a, a piece that um, is um, part of an even large uh, process, uh, a process that goes from uh, in this case, uh, the raw material, which is in my case the tobacco leaf, uh, the transportation of this raw material to the factory, and then the journey that the manufactured product uh, makes from the factory uh, to the distribution points. So um, the building is not um, a heritage. Uh, material heritage, as to say, but it's part of uh, a bigger process. And then it's part of um, a landscape uh, produced by all these um, uh, events, all these pieces of the same process uh, that um, create um, a landscape. And in this case, it's a landscape, an urban landscape, because uh, tobacco factories in Spain uh, had a strong relation with their urban condition, their urban location. Uh, and it's also, uh, I think, uh, even if it's an, a specific case study, it's not a, a general topic, uh, which I'm going to present you today, I think uh, it will be very interesting for um, the later discussion uh, to show you this methodology that goes from the territory to the city, to the building itself, and also to the human, let's say human di dimension, uh, which is the workers, in this case, the female workers, that are um, an important part of the heritage that uh, this um, tobacco industry uh, has given uh, to us, uh, this, this personal, uh, histories of, of the female workers, uh, their um, um, fights, uh, their, um, the, the importance for the empowering of the women, and also um, um, their relations with the neighborhood and the people around the, the, the factories. So um, I'm not going to, to extend more the introduction. I'm going to jump uh, just into the the, the topic. Um, I also uh, want to say that um, this uh, close relationship between uh, the industrial heritage and the and the cultural landscape um, in general allows uh, the building uh, not to be considered as an isolation uh, isolated uh, element, but inserted into an environment that uh, gives uh, the building uh, multiple historical and cultural contents and references to its uh, social, cultural, and uh, urban and environmental uh, dimensions. You know? So uh, connecting this um, vision, uh, this, this, this vision of, of connecting elements is essential in urban industrial landscape in achieving um, more effective conservation and also to interpret this uh, heritage correctly in order to um, in order to consider these buildings uh, in terms of adaptive reuse or buildings to be repurposed after the um, the, indu the industry is gone uh, so I, I, as I was saying, um, is um, we have to consider these buildings not as uh, empty uh, containers, but as um, spaces with meanings and with a history that needs to be keep uh, kept uh, in their uh, conservation, in their restoration, and even in their um, adaptive reuse. So jumping to 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 the presentation. It, so, um, 
I'm going to give you um, a little context. Uh, we have to um, um, have to see that um, this uh, industry that emerged with the importation of uh, the tobacco um, it was nationalized in Spain. Uh, it was set up in the 17th uh, century, but it was mostly in the 18th century when it was developed. It, and um, it was considered as a luxury product. So um, it was great with uh, some taxes uh, in, that went to the royal coffers, to the crown coffers uh, directly. So uh, with, the, um, um, with the growing of the, um, of the consumption, of the tobacco consumption, first with the high classes, then with the popularization among uh, the worker uh, classes, um it was um an expansion was needed uh, in order to um uh, distribute this uh, product uh, to the many um, cities where uh, tobacco was uh, consumed but there was a problem with smuggling uh, smuggling through via the the port where the tobacco will, um, arrived uh, from from the Americas, and also there was like a sort of uh, black market and um, 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 manufacturing like a manufacturing um, made um, outside the 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 principal uh, factories. At the beginning, there were uh, Sevilla and Cadiz, and then, as I was saying, uh, during the 19th century, there's an expansion uh, in port cities where many uh, tobacco factories were um, uh, established uh, near the consumption um, points. So um, this expansion uh, was developed, as I said, uh, in various generations of, of factories, um, as I called them, uh, the generations of the 19th century uh, factories. And um, they started with the pioneer, a pioneering uh, Sevilla factory in the 18th century, uh, which, which was followed by its support factory of, of Cadiz. But then we have uh, many of these uh, factories in uh, Alicante, Valencia, uh, Coruña, Gijón, Santander, etc., uh, that were uh, founded uh, during the 19th uh, century. And the need for uh, during this, this period, uh, the 18th and 19th century, and also uh, mostly uh, 18th and 19th century, uh, a general production system logic uh, was uh, identified from the initial phase when tobacco factories were characterized by uh, their manufacturing uh, condition, typical of, of artisanal produ production. And then there was a second phase in the 19th century where uh, they started them on a, a modernization, let's say modernization and rationalization of the productive spaces uh, with the um, uh, um, acquisition of uh, machinery. And the need for a rapid extension of this um, tobacco manufacturing uh, monopoly system in the, 18, in the 19th century meant that um, the monopoly of the state uh, wasn't able to uh, make a brand new project, uh, a project of a new construction building in every city uh, that uh, wanted to be established. So they have to um, acquire or even rent uh, existing buildings uh, that were in origin uh, buildings with um, many other uh, purposes, many other uses, such as uh, for example, um, warehouses or custom offices or another industries, and even the more uh, particular ones that were uh, or, or singular ones that were uh, ex-convents, uh, convents that uh, were 
the commission uh, in order to uh, be a new space for, for this industry. Uh, as you are seeing in this uh, quick view of uh, all these 12 uh, factories, uh, they have uh, many peculiar things and also common features uh, in their architecture. Uh, but many of them are also uh, like uh, they have its own um, uh, original features uh, belonging to, um, let's say, the um, uh, architecture or traditional architecture of the region in their were uh, built or the um, um, or, or the moment of the production, the historical moment of the production uh, in the in which they were um, uh, conceived. Let's let's say, um, but they were all uh, monumental buildings that um, at the beginning uh, you don't picture them as factories, but uh, uh, it was. Um, um, an image that um, the monopoly, uh, the tobacco monopoly, uh, wanted to give uh, its factories. So to to show this power, to show that they were uh, just random, that weren't uh, just random factories, but uh, factories of the um, a monopoly of of tobacco in in Spain. Uh, and these dimensions, uh, I was talking to you about. Um, at the beginning, uh, that are beyond the building itself, are very important uh, on my research, and and I think uh, and these dimensions give meaning not only for the reading of 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 the building, uh, the architectural reading of the of the building, uh, but also for the um, approach that is going to be taken taken uh, in, in the adaptive reuse, in, in the restoration and repurpose of this, or repurposing of, of these uh, buildings. So uh, the interpretation of uh, tobacco factories in Spain as industrial heritage has been developed through um, complex multi-scale uh, reality uh, of this industrial architectural legacy uh, form, but by its context, which is, which is um, a territorial, but also urban, um, by by its architecture, of course, um, the the production spaces, but also uh, the workers. And the analysis uh, is a structure around factors related to um, territorial interpretation of Spanish tobacco factories, the importance of their relationship uh, with uh, the port facilities, uh, their location in the urban fabric, uh, but also the formalization of the architecture in its uh, dialogue with uh, the surrounding environment. And also, of course, the tangible and intangible relationships established uh, with the city through um, mostly the figure of the female uh, workers. So, as I was saying, in terms of territory, we have to think that uh, this journey, uh, um, this production journey starts uh, in America, uh, where the raw material came. Uh, this tobacco leaf um, from states, uh, Puerto Rico, uh, Cuba, uh, Brazil, uh, it mainly uh, came uh, via uh, ports. Uh, in Spain, uh, there were uh, select a selection of uh, cities in which uh, the, the, the raw material came uh, via these, these ports. And we have to see that uh, there is a sort of coincidence between the ports uh, where the tobacco enter the, the country and uh, the cities uh, that uh, uh, were um, chosen uh, to hold a um, tobacco factory. So uh, 
it's a coincidence and, and not a, a casual one. Uh, but um, jumping to these dimensions uh, from the territory to, to the city, you have to make a, a, a zoom in and, and think about uh, two different situations, which were um, the situation where the uh, tobacco factory was uh, in the center, in, a, in, in the historical center of the city, in a central location of the city, which were these uh, factories that were installed in on pre-existing buildings, uh, buildings that were uh, repurposed for tobacco industry, and the ones that were uh, in a close peripheral uh, location to the city, which were uh, those new projects uh, of uh, new buildings that were constructed for uh, this particular purpose for the tobacco industry. So I'm going to give you some examples of its uh, dimension, as I say, these dimensions that I'm, I, I call. Uh, the, the first one is um, in my hometown, Gijón, which is also the city that uh, hosts um, these um, INCUNA conferences that uh, Juan Manuel was talking about. Uh, this is um, the factory. I, I don't know. the. In, have you, uh, do, do you see the, the pointer? Uh, yes, yes, we can see the okay. pointer. Okay, so this is the factory. Uh, this is an old image because uh, this is now being, um, 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 this, this, this factory has been um, um, repurposed for, for cultural center. Uh, but this is the, the factory of, of, of Gijón. It was in the uh, very center of the historical city, near the, uh, sorry, near the port, uh, which is now obviously a modern port, but it was near the, the historical port, uh, near the city council, the, all the uh, important buildings of the city, because this was also a characteristic of industry, uh, of uh, tobacco industry, their factories were uh, near not only the port and infrastructures that uh, led uh, the uh, distribution uh, of the, the manufacture um, product, but also uh, wanted to be uh, monumental, monumental buildings and also near uh, the um, uh, buildings that um, hold the significance and the power of the city, such as city councils, uh, etc. So, as you can see, uh, this factory, many, uh, all of the factories are uh, closed on the first decade of the 21st century. And many of them uh, were working till uh, the first decade of the 20th century, uh, particularly um, the factory of Gijón uh, uh, work uh, was functioning uh, till 2002 in this uh, very location. So uh, as you can see, it was a picturesque uh, location, but also very difficult for um, uh, production, uh, the production needs. Uh, the transportation of the raw material and the product uh, um, manufacture. And also, uh, um, in, on the other side, uh, as example of a suburb um, at the moment, at that moment, the a suburb um, factory was uh, the Royal Factory of Sevilla, which was a new plant uh, project uh, located outside uh, Sevilla, outside the city uh, walls, uh, but also very near to the port and the river and uh, appearing in the landscape as um, a sort of piece of connection uh, between the urban fabric and the field and the landfill. You can see in these images, by the time it was just outside the, the city, and it was like the starting point of all the development of the drillings that uh, later on um, appeared uh, in this uh, peripheral area of the of the city. Also, in terms of, of, of urban relations, we have to talk about the port, uh, as I was saying before, 
um, the port was an important infrastructure, an important part uh, for this uh, tobacco production. And so it was for uh, the relation of the factory with uh, the city and particularly with uh, this infrastructure. And as we can see here with uh, the factory of Cardiff, which is this, uh, it was located uh, also in the center, in the in the in the um, let's say historical uh, center of of the city, but uh, very close to the port and uh, also close to the railway station that appeared uh, years before uh, the foundation of 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 the um, of the factory. We can see now the, the the building the factory here, the port and the railway station, and how uh, the main entrance was here, facing not the port and the railway station, but uh, the intricate streets of, of of the center of the historical center. And this relation with the port also ex ex expanded and. Um, um, was established with uh, many facilities that uh, were supporting these factories as they were houses, warehouse of, of Cadi. The architecture in this presentation and in this part of in specific part of, of my of my research uh, is not about the um, production space itself, but the relation that the architecture established with uh, with um, its environment. Um, as I was saying, uh, these are the factories of Sevilla, uh, San Sebastian, uh, Valencia, and Tarragona. And you can see that uh, at the beginning, they appear as um, such as such as palace kind uh, facades, are uh, monumental buildings with a classical language. Uh, this was uh, because of this um, um, significant, uh, significant, this meaning of power that um, the um, monopoly uh, wanted to give to the to to its buildings. But also, we have these um, uh, elements that are like um, a sort of um, sort of wall or a sort of element of. Um, um, of protection for the buildings, uh, many of them uh, even like medieval ones, uh, such as the moat of, of, of Sevilla. The factory had a moat uh, surrounding uh, the factory, and it was because they have a, um, a strong uh, um, politics uh, on avoiding the smuggling and the burglary of the product, because as I was as I was saying at the beginning, it was uh, conceived as a luxury product in in Spain, the the tobacco, and uh, also because there was uh, like a sort of black market uh, for the popular uh, class, for the popular um, for the workers and and the 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 popular classes. So uh, they have like these uh, kind of architectural elements that were protecting the, the building it, itself. And it was conceived like to be uh, seen by the outside and like, like as a show off, but not to be uh, entered by anyone that wasn't the female workers, the, the cigar makers. And also inside the this um, meaningful uh, features, uh, this, um, this significance was also given to the courtyards that inside the factory uh, were um, uh, very important, uh, uh, not only as uh, production spaces, but also as uh, meaningful spaces for, for the factories. So this meaningful and this significance and these uh, monumental features uh, are just um, um, an opposite uh, feature or face uh, this uh, reality inside reality that were uh, these female workers with uh, at first manufacturing after uh, with the machinery uh, working with the machinery um, uh, as I said is it was like um, a reality versus this monumental uh, image given on the outside and all but also a very powerful sorry, a very powerful image of this um, power uh, women uh, 
uh, working inside the, the the factory in like a very dignity, uh, strong dignity um, image. And uh, finally, in this uh, progress of, of dimensions, we have to, to focus, zoom in more and focus on the female workers and um, the heritage that they have created, which is a uh, heritage that belongs to the sphere of the immaterial, of the intangible aspects, because uh, they can be recovered only by um, photographic uh, documents or testimonials, uh, but were very important and are the core of uh, the center of the uh, interpretation, the reading of, of, of these buildings. Uh, as you can see, um, these buildings, even though the, those ones that were repurposed for um, the um, tobacco production, such as the one that I was so, showing you in Gijón, um, had, uh, from the point of view of you, uh, archaeologists are um, very interesting because they have uh, the tobacco uh, period, the tobacco production period, but also, uh, for example, the convent period. And also, if you dig more uh, in the case, uh, for instance, of Gijón, where we can have also uh, a Roman period uh, right on the ground. Uh, with the uh, um, uh, excavations that have been done and, and, and many vestiges of the uh, Roman Empire have um, appeared. Uh, so uh, from the material point of view, uh, these uh, buildings are very interesting, but also from the immaterial, the intangible point of view, we have also to consider uh, these scenes uh, as the one I show you of these uh, female workers uh, on the productive space, um, um, the atmosphere that they created with the uh, with they entering the factory and also leaving the factory and all the um, let's say uh, relations that they create with the uh, commerce, the neighbors, and all the people around uh, the factory. Um, I, as I'm taking a lot of time, I'm going to jump just on on these particular uh, characteristics of, of of the cigar makers. Um, from the material point of view, uh, in the factories, we have to see uh, many spaces that were created because of the uh, female condition of, of these workers, uh, such as the uh, spaces where, uh, how do you say, gynecologists, <laughs> sorry, gynecologists uh, gave the service, but also uh, many spaces that were um, um, for, um, dedicated to uh, the nursing. And, and later on, uh, even uh, in many factories, the, uh, in the uh, right, uh, right um, in front of the factories appeared these nursing houses where the female workers uh, um, let, uh, leave their, let their, their children, uh, their babies to be, uh, to be nurse. Uh, and also uh, their infants their and their children to 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 go to school or, or to to be taken care of and also uh, in this was uh, sorry this was the the nursing house at the at the factory of of Valencia which is now I think as far like that. <laughs> Um, but also, uh, there's an interesting research I recommend you to 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 consult uh, by Paloma Candela Soto, Doctor Paloma Candela Soto, on the uh, female workers of, of the factory of Madrid. Uh, I, I I have taken this example because it's a, a very interesting example uh, in which. Um, we can see uh, how uh, these female workers uh, in their factories uh, had strong connections between them. They were like a family. And this connection went beyond the factory 
and also uh, was um, uh, developed in the domestic space, in, the, in their houses, in their neighborhoods, uh, with their neighbors, with the, um, with the, um, I think with with the the families that were uh, depending on the in these women, not only economically uh, in an economic way, but also uh, in a domestic way. Let, let's say because they were um, both uh, a central pillar of the um, of their homes uh, as mothers, as um, uh, as as women. Uh, but also a uh, um, very important uh, piece of this or element uh, of these factories uh, to be functioning. And even in Madrid, uh, the... Oh, Car the Carolina, way... sorry. Uh, excuse me, Carolina. Uh, yeah. Two minutes, please. Yeah. Okay. So two minutes. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was... I was I, yeah, I was finishing. Uh, sorry. Oh, today I'm a little bit tired. <laughs> I, I also uh, I, I also a little bit fussy, but uh, okay, I'm I'm finishing. So this uh, in Madrid, uh, this was a uh, very um, uh, very peculiar because of uh, the the way the housing was made by the time uh, with these uh, corrala type buildings, uh, in which uh, people live more outside uh, the the house. Uh, uh, in the courtyard, in these corridors, than inside the house, and many of them there, uh, they were um, cigar makers, and uh, they extended their professional relationship even in the domestic uh, space. Uh, so uh, I'm not going to repeat myself. These are uh, just two uh, images. Uh, picturing these uh, intangible aspects as, uh, that I was talking about, these images that uh, are not going to be repeated uh, in the present day, the cigar makers of Sevilla crossing the, the river from the Tiriana uh, neighborhood uh, in their way to, to the factory, uh, and also uh, the main entrance of the of the factory of of Gijón, with all the relatives, uh, the children waiting for the mothers, uh, also uh, sellers, small sellers here with uh, potatoes, veg vegetables that were also taking opportunity for the for the um, um, cigar makers to to go outside and and purchase the the their goods. And this, um, just to finish, uh, these uh, aspects, as you can see, are not uh, specifically architectural aspects, but are uh, dimensions that need to be uh, kept uh, when you think on a repurpose for these buildings. Uh, nowadays, there are buildings belonging to the public administration. Uh, in uh, an strategical uh, location in the city, uh, many of them were um, repurposed for um, a specific use, such as Sevilla, which is a, a university facility, or Logroño, which is the parliament of, of, of La Rioja, or San Sebastian, which is now a cultural center. But with the economic crisis, many of them uh, has uh, ha has started to have start have started to 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 take the an strategy of um, uh, of uh, conservation uh, by phases by different phases and with a mixture of uses to make it more sustainable and also to to to, to respond for the needs of uh, today's. Uh, society. So here we have in color the factories that are now um, still um, being repurposed, being still uh, restored. And just uh, to finish with uh, this image, uh, yeah, uh, just to finish with with uh, with with this image uh, that for me is very important uh, because I'm not a sociologist. Uh, I'm not uh, archaeologist, but uh, many disciplines have um, uh, helped me to to read as an architect uh, these buildings, these industrial buildings, 
with uh, so many layers of uh, complex layers of 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 meanings uh, that need to be taken care uh, when reading uh, these these buildings, right? And and just just to finish, a little advertising time. Uh, I'm joking, but um, if you are interested on uh, this research on uh, the details or other specific aspects of of this research, this research that I'm not talking about uh, today, uh, you can acquire the this book, which is on CICES uh, publisher. Uh, it's a publisher that also uh, has um, many interesting. Uh, uh, books on industrial heritage, may, mainly on industrial heritage. Uh, so I recommend you to take a look at this website. Unfortunately, uh, it is in Spanish. It is not transla translated into English. So for those of you who want uh, an English version of, of, of the this um, uh, aspects that I've, I've been commenting in my presentation, more detail and and, and more specific, uh, you can take a look at the paper that my director of thesis, of thesis and I published in Industrial Archaeology Review. And I think it, it is uh, for free download these days. So you're welcome to, to take a look at it. And even if you ha want to, in a, in a time that I'm be more, uh, more awake uh, and mm -hmm. not with a, with my daughter uh, Aaron, uh, I can share um, suggestions, comments, uh, ideas. Uh, we can exchange ideas via email. So I I leave you here my my email uh, for everything you you want me to mm. to to say. And just okay. I I just okay. finished Juan Manuel. Sorry for mm. the funny yeah. <laughs> the funny mental right. state. <laughs> No, no, it was brilliant, really beautiful uh, research with a gender uh, perspective. Uh, there are some questions for you on the chat facility, but we will leave them for, for the end of the meeting since we are a little bit uh, ahead of time. So thank okay. you very much, Carolina. Uh, okay, lovely sorry if I extended my time. Uh, no problem. It was okay. a really interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, we travel now to China, to Beijing, where we are going to meet uh, Dr. Fang Lei Meng, who got his PhD from uh, the School of Architecture of Tsinghua University, and is currently an Associate Professor of Architecture and Urban Planning at the Beijing University of Civil Engineering and Architecture, as well as a, a visiting scholar at uh, Delft University of Technology in uh, the Netherlands. As Carolina, uh, Fang Dei is a very active scholar in the field of industrial heritage uh, in China. He belongs to a number of institutions, among them, the Industrial Architectural Heritage Academic Committee of the Architectural Society of China, and also the Industrial Heritage Academic Committee of the China Cultural Relics Protection Association. He has long experience working with uh, the architecture of industry from several angles, heritage making, presentation of heritage, adaptive reuse. Uh, but I would like to highlight two of his works, such as uh, his work for the fifth uh, batch of the National Industrial Heritage of China, and also uh, his work, a more practical work in the project for the adaptive reuse of Xinhua 1949 Cultural and Creative Industrial Park in Beijing. Today, uh, Dr. Fan Lei Meng is going to talk about uh, his research on the history and architectural heritage value of industrial construction in modern Beijing. Thank you very much, Fan Lei. The floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jeroen. Can you hear me? Does that work? Yeah, yeah. Everything okay. works. Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm really glad to be invited by Jeroen to participate in uh, this workshop. Uh, I am uh, Meng Fan Lei from the School of Architecture and Urban Planning, uh, Beijing University of Civil Engineering and Architecture. So um, today my uh, research topic is the research on the history 
and the architectural heritage uh, value of industrial architecture in modern Beijing. Uh, and they especially focus on the time during 1960 to 1949. Uh, the, uh, 1860 to 1949, uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> sorry, yeah. Uh, so my report uh, today will consist of five uh, sections, including uh, introduction, the birth and the development of Beijing's industrial buildings, and the exploration and the creation heritage and its value and the summary. Okay, let's uh, start with the first one, introduction. So as uh, uh, as is known to all, uh, the UK was the uh, birthplace of the world's industrial revolution and the origin of its industrial buildings can be tracked, uh, traced back to the textile workshops. So in terms of the form, uh, in order to meet the needs uh, machinical equipment and other things, buildings with large Spain and uh, internal space have appeared. Since then, the design and the construction of the industrial buildings has gradually formed its own characteristics, uh, presuming maxi uh, maximum space, efficiently, practical, and simple. Compared with the Western countries, China's industrialization started uh, relatively late. Uh, industrial architecture didn't uh, emerge in China until the Westernization movement in the mid-late 19th century. So in fact, Beijing, uh, as the captain uh, of the late Qing dynast uh, dynasty, was the first to witness to start and the development of modern industry and one of the first cities to be exposed to outcomes of the modern industrial revolution. So three uh, very outcome Chinese scholar have studied industrial uh, architectures in China. Uh, Professor Zhang Fuhe in his uh, books about the history of modern architecture in Beijing list, uh, listed industrial buildings as one of the Western style building types. Point out that modern industrial architecture such as factories, uh, warehouses and the railway station uh, buildings uh, reflect the deep uh, imprint of Western style buildings. And uh, in Lai Delin and some other people's work, uh, the history of modern Chinese architecture, industrial architecture has been emphasized, but focus on the discussion is concentrated in the early port cities such as Shanghai, Wuhan and other <clears throat> Uh, places rather than in Beijing. Okay, let's move to the part two is the birth and the, the development of Beijing's industrial buildings. So before discussing the development of Beijing industrial buildings, we need to know that Beijing's industrial development include, uh, included three important historical stages. The Qing uh, uh, dynasty, <clears throat> and as we know, is the the government by Qing. And the second one uh, is the Northern Warlord period. And the third one is the National uh, Government period. So between the uh, in the first period is the Qing government period uh, between 19, uh, six, uh, 1860 to 19, uh, 1910, uh, impacted by the war, uh, the, uh, the war between uh, Qing Dynasty and the UK, the, the government began to implement the Western uh, uh, the Western nation movement in 1960s, uh, in 1860, I'm sorry, which led to the uh, emergencies of the government run industrials, uh, government business and cooperation, government supervision of business, Chinese foreign joint and other uh, modes of operations. By importing Western uh, machinery and the equipment, uh, employing foreign uh, techniques, uh, techniques and the manage and other ways, the Qing uh, government built a number of more advanced industrial enterprise, such as uh, machinery, uh, macu uh, manufacturing, uh, coal mining, textile, uh, printing, and so on. So during the second period is the uh, Northern Warlord period. 
the living uh, standard of the citizens was greatly improved. Uh, improved. And a number of industrial and mining enterprises uh, for, uh, founded by national captains ca uh, came into being one after another. And the people's uh, leave, hole, uh, leave holes in many uh, areas, especially in light industrial such as uh, textile, around uh, many uh, manufacturing and so on. Although most of the factories uh, purchase their production equipment from Western countries, but they have in the local, uh, in the location of the factories uh, of and the construction of plants, uh, modes and op uh, of operations, uh, appointment of personnel and uh, a distribution uh, of uh, equity and so on. During this period, they built such uh, buildings, uh, they built such uh, uh, plants as Beijing, Shuanghe uh, Sheng, uh, Bravery, uh, and uh, Beijing Longyan Iron and uh, Steel Factories, like the pictures uh, on the screen's right. This is the Beijing Shuang Shenghe uh, Bravery uh, factory. And uh, this, one, uh, this one is founded in 1919. Uh, is a, it's the original of Shogang area. Uh, we know it's very famous in Beijing now. <clears throat> and in the third period is the national government. Uh, during the war between China and uh, the uh, Japan, uh, which was uh, uh, especially uh, specially established in 1938, uh, uh, the uh, Japanese set up the first industrial planning in Beijing, and uh, this, uh, which is the shown in the picture, like uh, in the screen's uh, left, and you can see this one. Uh, this one uh, is the uh, industrial area located in the east, uh, between the old city uh, in China, uh, in Beijing, and this, uh, which was planned and contract, uh, constructed by the Japanese uh, occupy, uh, occup uh, occupation in Beijing at that time. So uh, during the uh, late national uh, government, the period of the war of liberation, a number of uh, early built in industrial uh, plants received the damage during the war, but a number of factories was restored and became the basic of Beijing's earliest modernized industrials. Okay, the third part is the uh, exploration and the creation. Uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, emergence of the industrial heritage not only influenced the part uh, the pattern of the urban development, but also grand uh, gradually showed its influence on the urban landscape and architectural style. Uh, compared with other cities, uh, Beijing. Our uh, early uh, industrial architecture uh, developed three outstanding feature, uh, features in terms of form and style. The first one is the uh, continu uh, uh, continu uh, continuation of the residential architecture pattern. And the second one is the decoration of the regional uh, style symbols. And the third one is the bold, uh, ex uh, ex uh, mm, how to say, uh, experimental uh, experimentation with uh, new buildings materials. So the first is the uh, continuation of the residential architectural pattern. The picture shows the Beijing water uh, plant, uh, which was built in 1908. The appearance of the plant adopts the courtyard uh, houses. Uh, we know the courtyard house is very uh, quite uh, familiar uh, seen in Hutong area. It is the traditional Chinese residential buildings. Uh, and also with the brick uh, carving and the paintings uh, as decorations. And, uh, and this, the gates and other uh, partial shapes are in the Western uh, architectural style which is in architectural heritage that combines Chinese and the Western elements. And uh, we can see uh, now uh, this architectural heritage has been well protected 
and has be, uh, been become an open uh, museum. And the second is the uh, decorative uh, regional style symbols. The picture uh, presents several uh, early industrial buildings, include a railway building, Qinglongqiao Station, uh, which is a part of Jinjiang Tianlu, uh, Jinjiang Railway. Uh, and uh, in the middle is the uh, Shuangshenghe Bravery uh, factory that we have talked uh, in just uh, before. And uh, the uh, red one is a textile building uh, called uh, Qinghe uh, and uh, uh, Qinghe Leather Factory. The Qinglongqiao Railway Station, which is built uh, in 1909, used the design language of the Great Wall in China to decorate its facade. Uh, we can see here, yeah, just uh, like uh, something like the Great Wall. And, uh, um, and also use the Western style uh, clones uh, and the arc uh, at the doors, uh, windows, and other parts. The office, uh, the office building of Qinghe, uh, Qinghe Leather Factory in 1909 was also in the Western style as a whole, but uh, in the, uh, we can see some Chinese uh, decorations uh, in these columns and other parts. So at present, this railway station has been transformed into Beijing, uh, a Jinjiang Railway Museum and uh, Qinghe, uh, fe but Qinghe Feather uh, Factory was just uh, preserved, but uh, it didn't have uh, new functions. And But uh, unfortunately, the pictures in this middle, uh, we know the Shuangshenghe Bravery uh, plant has been demolished. Okay, the third uh, is the use of new buildings materials. Uh, this is the Jinghua uh, Book Printing Company. And the left one is the history image and this building was established in uh, 1884 and it was the first uh, multi-story buildings which adopts a reinforced concrete frame structure in Beijing with, uh, 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 with a triangular uh, plan. And uh, the right one uh, is, is, uh, uh, is, is the image just uh, several days ago. Uh, I took this picture and it's now uh, transformed into a coffee bar and uh, a new uh, uh, bookshop. Okay, let's move to the uh, heritage and the value of Beijing uh, modern industrial uh, uh, buildings. Uh, until uh, 90, uh, 2021, uh, Beijing has added up to 65 industrial heritage with kind of uh, definitions, including about 19, uh, 17 17 industrial heritage from the modern historical uh, building uh, period. And uh, this include uh, national uh, culture heritage, uh, Beijing culture heritage, Beijing outstanding mood, modern architecture, and the China's industrial heritage protection lists and so on. The heritage uh, covers railways, uh, uh, pres uh, preventions, control, uh, prevention and control, iron and steel, uh, uh, cigarettes and uh, alcohols and other industrials. Uh, in my research, um, Beijing's modern industrial heritage include four uh, meanings. The from the from the uh, per, uh, the first one is the political and economic point of the view. Beijing's industrial heritage reflects the history of China's industrial development in the modern area, uh, in the modern time. Uh, sorry, uh, especially witness a, a series of self-improvement uh, measures taken by Beijing in the face of the in face of the impact of the achievements and of the Western Industrial Revolution. In terms of the uh, social history value, the industrial buildings records the history of the development of uh, industrial construction in Beijing's history and. Uh, uh, moving towards uh, to uh, a repu uh, re uh, republic and the bears witness to the birth development and uh, uh, its national uh, 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 redevelopment under the difficult conditions of uh, war laws and uh, uh, Japanese uh, war. And from the artist and the aesthetic value, 
perspective, in terms of the urban uh, numbers uh, of uh, industrial buildings uh, from industrial area reflect the industrial style. Uh, in terms of uh, architectural design, whether it is uh, application of a new material or uh, uh, immigrants of new industrial buildings, shapes, the Chinese and the Western styles, they all bear witness to the landing, roofing, and the growth of modernist uh, industrial architecture in Chinese cities. And the last one is in terms of the economics and the cultural value. Modern industrial buildings have outstanding advantage in, process, uh, in the process of transform, uh, transformation uh, into uh, museums, uh, heritage park, and the creative industrial park due to their high historical value and uh, unique cultures memories, which are more historical, story-like, and uh, culture than general new buildings uh, and are the uh, spento uh, carriages uh, embodying the value of the heritage. And uh, finally, I would like to uh, a short summary of my uh, research. From the uh, social uh, level, under the uh, the uh, under the uh, the is uh, the certain history of uh, China. Beijing's modern industry started to show uh, sh uh, slowly and uh, progressed in uh, a special way. It is reflected at the aptitude and the goal of the ruling class toward, uh, towards the industrial development in different historical periods. At the economic level, industrial sectors uh, were gradually established during this, peer, uh, du during this period, uh, covering a wide range of um, fields such as light and heavy, industrial and transportation and so on. From the perspective of heritage pres pres uh, preservation, Beijing's modern industrial architecture uh, reflects the relationship between economics construction and urban redevelopment in the early uh, uh, urban, uh, not a redevelopment, it's uh, urban development uh, in, the early, uh, in the early uh, 20th century. And it is, uh, it is also the interaction and the fusion between the Western architecture and the traditional Chinese uh, architecture. Although many uh, modern industrial uh, monuments no longer uh, exist, uh, his, uh, but the history of modern industrial development that lasting for more than 100 years is uh, worth remembering. And it has uh, inspired the uh, development of Beijing's industrial heritage and uh, provided a broad and uh, solid foundation for the large scale uh, modern industrial construction of the capital uh, after 1948. Uh, we know it is the foundation of the People's Republic of China. This will provide, is, uh, provide a, a valuable historical information and a basic samples for further research on the core value of Beijing industrial architectural heritage and for the establishment of a more comprehensive and a micros, uh, uh, microscopic industrial architectural heritage protection system. So these are the some uh, re reference of, of my study. Okay. Oh, thank you for all. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Fan Lei. Very uh, brilliant uh, research and a fantastic case, by the way, of the interactions between East and West in uh, early industrialization. So, thank you very much for your brilliant uh, presentation. Okay. Thank you, John. Yeah. So, uh, thanks to you. So, we, we move now to mm -hmm. our last uh, presentation today, uh, which is going to be a different experience, I believe. Is going to be delivered by Dr. Gordon Davies, who uh, got a PhD from the University of Oxford, uh, studying ancient world technology. And after that, uh, he has developed his career as a content producer for the high technology industry. That is exactly what he does, I mean, uh, to produce content uh, as a volunteer for uh, the Cambridge Museum of Technology. And, and I am very really glad that, uh, well, even though, uh, of course, Gordon is also a PhD, today we have three doctors, 
uh, but he's representing also the volunteers, which is a, a very important part of industrial archaeology, especially in the UK. So, so today we have uh, scholars, professionals, and volunteers, even though, as I said, uh, the three of them are uh, have, hold uh, PhDs. So re related to uh, his work producing digital content, uh, he has produced a series of documentary videos, for example, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Cambridge Museum of Technology, also to explore the gas works of Cambridge, and also to record the restoration works of the steam boilers and steam engines there in the Cambridge Museum of Technology that are used in the uh, museum's steam days. But perhaps uh, his most to date uh, international relevant project is the 21st century time capsule in which he has been recording now in a uh, international project combining science and arts, the landscapes and also the soundscapes of uh, around the uh, Cambridge uh, Museum of Technology. That is something related to this, uh, this kind of production is what we are going to see uh, today uh, from Gordon in his presentation, An Industrial Tale of Two Cities, filming the architecture of industry around Cambridge, Museum of Technology, and Athens, Technopolis. Uh, Gordon, uh, please, uh, thank you very much, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Juan. Uh, I'm going to share a video. I will keep my camera off during the sharing of the video. Okay. Thank you to the Association for Industrial Archaeology for the invitation to present at this online workshop. I'm Gordon Davis, a member of Cambridge Museum of Technology in the UK. I ought to preface that opinions expressed in this research presentation are my own. The project I will present has involved the assistance of many contributors, museum staff, researchers, video contractors, museum volunteers, as well as museum funding partners. In 2022, I made a proposal for the East West Workshop series when I was in the pre-production phase of a twinning research collaboration project between Cambridge Museum of Technology and the Industrial Gas Museum at Technopolis, City of Athens. I'm delighted to now have the opportunity to share with the Association for Industrial Archaeology the first public showing of the cooperation between these industrial museums. Cambridge Museum of Technology explores the city's industrial heritage from the steam age to semiconductors. This independent, volunteer-led museum, located in the old sewage pumping station, celebrated its 50th year of public opening in 2021. Technopolis, city of Athens, hosts an industrial past, cultural present, and innovative future. Technopolis includes an industrial gas museum, inaugurated in 2013, a unique monument of industrial heritage the only preserved gas works to have maintained its entire mechanical equipment in place. In Cambridge, the University Library was designed by the same architect, Giles Gilbert Scott, as Battersea Power Station in London. 
the architect used ancient Mesopotamian and Assyrian palaces and temples as design references for both buildings. Which raises a question. If a library can be the architectural twin of a power station and both are designed in the style of Bronze Age Mesopotamia, is there actually an architecture of industry? The point is to show that industrial architecture has many external influences, including religious and civic architecture, a theme that is explored in this tale of two industrial cities. A small church, almost. Toplit. Dust motes held in sunlight. In vapour, patterning the floor. These decorated walls, glazed in green and yellow ochre, blue and hospital white. Tiles glistening, clean and smooth and cold. So why twin the architecture of industry in these cities? Firstly, there are similarities. A shared experience as industrial museums in urban locations that have had millennia long histories of trade and industry. Yet neither city tends to be strongly associated with the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century. Even though both cities are home to significant examples of industrial architecture from that period. Which architecture did you come to see? In Cambridge, the city's visual presentation, especially to tourist visitors, tends to be framed in terms of the city being a university academic town. But Cambridge also retains a surprising amount of industrial heritage for a relatively small city. Company records Photographs Museum volunteers have documented and salvaged architecture from the rapidly changing landscape around the museum in the early 21st century as the former gasworks was demolished for redevelopment. Which architecture did you come to see? In the case of Athens, architecture from thousands of years of habitation continues to attract archaeologists. But take a glimpse at the background. Even as the industrial architecture of Athens Fiterio gasworks first arrived in the 19th century, archaeological decisions about which architecture was to be retained, restored or demolished, such as the Frankish Tower on the Acropolis, were already changing the city's architectural heritage. Which architecture did you come to see? Another reason to twin. Industrial architecture and archaeology at the respective museums complements the other. The Industrial Gas Museum at Technopolis, city of Athens, retains the most complete archaeological example of a manufactured gasworks. This is juxtaposed with absence in Cambridge, where the gasworks was demolished and the site remediated. Another way that twinning 
complements industrial architecture. Both museums happen to contain examples of steam boilers built by Babcock and Wilcox. In Cambridge, the Museum of Technology has restored the boiler. which helps bring steam alive and hands-on for a new generation in the 21st century. Both remediated sites now also host non-human visitors. The industrial architecture is part of the local ecosystem. I have to declare a personal interest in selecting this research, having lived and studied and worked in both Athens and Cambridge. The filming project took an immersive approach, as defined in this recent academic reference, How Documentaries Work. Outside of the realm of traditional storytelling, immersive documentaries build a satisfying aesthetic experience setting up tonal patterns, notably these films tend to have little dialogue and no narration. These films nonetheless answer the question, what is this about? How were the films made? This video project has involved lots of teamwork, building on existing contributions by staff and volunteers, especially in archives. In Cambridge, architectural documents and photographs have been archived and digitised by museum staff and volunteers. In Hellas, museum staff have digitised and published architectural plans, site photographs, company records, workers' archives. Volunteers of the Hellenic Vault of Industrial Digital Archives have created a searchable database map containing architectural site plans, documents and photographs about the Athens gasworks before and after its transformation into Technopolis, city of Athens. I commissioned local photographers and drone videographers who operated within the respective Civil Aviation Authority's drone permits throughout the seasons and at different times of day and night. The drone team recorded the variety of colours 
that the museum's brickwork reflects. The composition of an accompanying soundtrack, mixed from recordings of the museum's own engines, turn the museum into an orchestra. In Cambridge, I commissioned a poem to match the rhythm of the engine sounds of the museum. Acrid tallow, coke and clinker, sulphurous, choking, filthy ash, decay. And always, deep in the well below, the sewage pumping, pumping, pumping the relentless tide rising and falling, the sweet and sour stench of it lingering on skin and hair and clothes. Yes, breathe deep and remember them all. In Athens, the goal was to create a thematic series of short, self-contained videos, each exploring related aspects of the architecture of industry. <laughs> Topics included taphonomy, a subject previously discussed in the workshop the Archaeology of Technology.
filming the architecture of industry addresses the question, where does industrial architecture belong? An accompanying bibliographic essay explores the architecture of industry as represented within the history of cinema, describes creative choices made in this film and provides resources for you to make your own visualisations of the architecture of industry. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Gordon, uh, for this uh, fantastic uh, production uh, in which you explore this creative approach to uh, the architecture of industry, in this case, that is so so inspiring, so suggesting. Uh, and also, I like very much, as we have discussed before, the, uh, the sensorial approaches to the materiality of the industrial past. I think uh, we are very limited to vision. And even though today, obviously, this was an audiovisual medium, but I uh, you know uh, from your work and part of what you have shown today, how other senses are activated in uh, the exploration and presentation of the industrial architecture, namely uh, the sounds, the smells, the textures. I think that is a very important avenue to explore because our approaches, I do believe, are very limited to vision and we are we are losing part of the experience and even part of the information. So thank you very much, Gordon. It was uh, totally brilliant. Thank you. And I'm actually, Juan, I'm, I'm delighted to say that um, Maria Manetta, oh, sorry, I'm delighted to say that Maria Manetta, who was the architect engineer on the Keramikos metros, uh, metro station installation project is has joined us on the uh, on the session so uh, I don't know if, if Maria wants to say anything during the um, uh, during the Q&A that, that would be I think very interesting to get get her hands-on perspective on uh, installing in in an in industrial environment absolutely yeah so so let's move to the question and answer uh, section I think we have something like six minutes per uh, presenter and there are already some questions on the chat facility, so uh, I suggest we follow the order of the presentations, six minutes, more or less, six, seven minutes per presenter, and, and we finish with this part of the, of the workshop. So first for uh, Carolina, uh, you have, uh, well, there is one comment by Mario Bruno Pastor uh, that you can answer uh, later in the chat, uh, but there are also two questions here. Uh, mm -hmm. One question by... NH, uh, he or she would like to know whether uh, the uh, tobacco factories in Spain use uh, slaves as well, or it was only the local workers or maybe slaves were also used for uh, the manufacturing of uh, tobacco. And Mark Watson uh, would like to know whether uh, these factories uh, used any other uh, source of power uh, beyond the hands of the women. Okay, 
Thank you, Juan, and thank you all for for your um, questions. Uh, yeah, um, about um, um, the, the the slaves, um, I didn't uh, study uh, the face of the cultivation of tobacco in America, so uh, I don't know if uh, in that part of the process during uh 17th and uh, 18th century this kind of situation was established but uh here in spain uh i say no uh, it was um an industry that was uh, uh functioning like a sort of uh a state-owned um um state-owned industry um, and so uh, these female workers um, at the beginning were um, entering the factories, uh, well, in a sort of casual way, uh, like um, a female uh, work hand uh, available on the cities, uh, many of them um, not married and very young and um they were like a cheap way let's say to get a uh, work hand in these factories but later on they were workers with the contracts with uh, some tests they have to um to took uh, to take uh, to enter this uh, this uh, industry and so um, this situation of slaves uh, was um, uh, established uh, not in in the tobacco industry, but I think in in, in any industry in in, in Spain, uh, slavery was not a, a a common situation here, or it was not a situation here uh, at all. And then um, about Mark Watson's question um yeah um yeah this is um this is um a situation that is um uh, peculiar because if you many of you have been uh, in cuba uh and have visited uh, many of the factories that are um, functioning right now uh you can see that there is some uh, mixture of women and men working in these factories but uh uh, this wasn't like this in Spain. Uh, at the beginning, in the Royal Factory of Sevilla, uh, we have uh, men working on the factory uh, because at the beginning, in the um, uh, 16th century and even in the seventh, uh, 17th century, um, uh, what was um, produced uh, was not cigar or cigarettes, but uh, powder uh, to sniff. Uh, rapé uh, in France. So uh, they used uh, horses and uh, mills uh, that were uh, functioning with these horses. And uh, when they start to make cigars, they employed uh, uh, men to, to do this task. By they uh, checked that uh, the cigars made uh, in the factory of Cadiz by female hands uh, were more appreciated by the consumers. So uh, this uh, situation in the um, uh, with the manufactured product of of Cadiz uh, make um, the the monopoly of tobacco change, change uh, its mind about employing uh, men, and instead they started to employ uh, mostly women uh, to manufacture these these products. And uh, in, during 18th and 19th century, we have uh, three, four thousand of women working in its factory. But with the um, initiation of the mechanization, uh, introducing machinery, mostly from Germany, but also uh, made here in, in, in Spain, um, this number of women uh, decays. And we have four, five uh, hundred uh, women uh, working in its factory uh, due to this uh, mechanization of of the of the production. Uh, but uh, there is still uh, a majority uh, in the factories, even if uh, men are employed in 
tasks like um, uh, maintenance work of the machinery or in the warehouses, uh, lifting um, the, the raw material. Uh, but um, yeah, I, women were uh, mostly the 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 people that were employed in this in these factories, and this machinery, as in any other industry, at the beginning it was um, powered by um, steam boilers or oil generators or so on, uh, but mostly electricity, and the women. Uh, change their task uh, from manual to uh, provide the uh, tobacco leaf to these machines that uh, mostly made uh, the cuts and the rolling and, and all these this task. I don't know if I'm already answered. Yeah, pretty question. well indeed. Uh, yeah. I think so, yeah, yeah. very good answer. I, so I want to mm -hmm. to congratulate my my fellow colleagues, uh, uh, the other speakers, because I really enjoyed their presentations, and I'm delighted uh, to see how uh, many of the um, aspects that we commented are related. Because, uh, for instance, Gordon's presentation, he was question, uh, he was uh, asking. Um, uh, about uh, the influence of uh, other architectures in industrial architecture, and it is, it's the the same case as mine, as when as Ming Fanley uh, presentation uh, with this uh, great wall aspects uh, into industrial architecture. So uh, it is the same for me. And maybe we are talking about industrial architecture, but it's more a complex thing uh, that is influenced by many other uh, architectures from different ages. Yeah, thank you very much, Carolina. I, I am also very pleased with uh, the three presentations today. I think we have a very good, very high level uh, here. So thanks to the three of you uh, very much. Uh, we have also a pair of questions for uh, Fan Lei Bong. Uh, Ian Mitchell, I would like to know what was the building uh, on in the final slide. Um, Mark Watson, uh, want to ask, uh, do Beijing factories show a fusion of Eastern and Western building techniques? Uh, hi, John. Uh, I didn't hear the last one. Uh, you mean your question is the uh, the industrial buildings in Beijing between the East and the West, uh, 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 what, <clears throat> the techni technicals or technical? Yeah, whether, whether these factories show a fusion of uh, building techniques, the building techniques, if there are Eastern and Western building techniques combined in the Beijing okay. factories. Okay, you, you mean the building techniques combined? Yeah, right? yeah. 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 Watson is here, he can uh, also say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yes, I, I, as I know, uh, uh, such as the buildings of uh, I just uh, talked about uh, is the uh, Jinghua uh, book printing uh, building. Uh, the, this building uh, was the first one used the uh, retained uh, concrete. I, I mean, this is the first uh, concrete buildings used in the industrial buildings in Beijing. So maybe uh, in since my major is architecture, so I always focus on the uh, materials and uh, constructing skills uh, in buildings. So I think maybe this one can uh, show the, uh, since the uh, concrete was just in, uh, imported from Western countries, uh, as we know that the traditional Chinese buildings always use uh, wood or stones uh, in the local places. So concrete was imported from Western countries and was first used into, uh, into these industrial buildings. In what year? Uh, what year? You mean the year? Yes, for the first reinforced concrete. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, first uh, concrete uh, is uh, built in nineteen, uh, maybe one eight uh, at that time, I think, in Beijing. But the first uh, concrete buildings in in uh, about industrial buildings in China, not in Beijing, in China, was more earlier. Is uh, I as I know, just as the at the end of uh, 19th centuries. Uh, and the, that building, I remember that is located in Qingdao area. It was uh, because Qingdao was the one of the first, uh, how, how to say, uh, the, the, uh, the cities uh, of international uh, trade. 
Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Farley. And, uh, and about yeah. the building, in the final slide, uh, the question by Ian Mitchell. He would like he would like to know uh, mm -hmm. what was the, the building in the final slide of your presentation. <clears throat> Shogun, I believe. Yeah, Shogun, what? Yeah, so, so he would like to know what was yeah. uh, the, the photograph in the last uh, slide. It was a picture of uh, Shogun. He, he would like to know more about what that photograph is uh, showing. One of the blast furnaces of Shogun, uh, right? Okay, I, I I can share my point points again. You mean oh, which yeah, picture of Shogun? Um, uh, the last the last one. The last, last one. Oh yeah. Slide, uh, you mean this one? Yeah, that one. Yeah. 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 He, he... yeah. Uh, uh, and this is the most significant uh, heritage in Shogun area, and it's the number uh, number three. Uh, how to say? Uh, uh furnish, right? Uh, furnish yeah. in, in Shogun area, and but this is not the uh, earliest furnish in Shogun, but uh, it is built uh, by uh, Chinese people, uh, and it is founded after nineteen forty eight. So and but uh, this furnish is the largest one at during that time. So it is the most significant in Shogun area, and it's now transformed into a industrial tour area. And this building we can see on this floor is transformed into a museum. It is the steel museum, and at this one at the top of this one is made of glass, and uh, we can see a, a bird wheel from here. To show, uh, to see the bird wheel of uh, the the whole city in Beijing, yeah, it is quite attractive. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, so thank you very much, uh, Fan Lei, for your okay. answers to uh, your brilliant, brilliant presentation. Okay. Uh, thank for you. Gordon, mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, for for Gordon, I uh, there are several comments uh, about uh, the drone video making, and and also we have. Uh, uh, question by Daniel Oshi that I believe you maybe can answer. He, he, he says uh, Ceylon tea was introduced to Peru in the early 20th century. I know a tea processing plant close to Machu Picchu, which has uh, machinery from a stoke on trend and an old system of pulleys, belts and boilers. How can I go about bringing this to the attention of the wider public? It is a rural location, but on a main route to Machu Picchu. I have contacts at the local municipality in the area. So any advice you can provide is very welcome. Hi, I, sorry, was that a question directed towards me? Uh, not exactly. Uh, but no, no, that's I, fine. Because I say it's beyond yeah. beyond my expertise, so I'm I'm happy to stay on mute for that one. Yeah, uh, but but it's uh, more generally uh, how uh, how to connect uh, society, how to connect the community, or how to make people make people attracted by industrial architecture. I think that your presentation, your work uh, with uh, these creative approaches, the the immersive documentary experiences, and the sensorial experiences, so all of that are of great interest uh, and can be exported to uh, Peru and anywhere else. So, any comments you would like to make uh, about that or uh, about your, your own uh, your own work, your own experience in uh, England and and, and Greece uh, are are very welcome, or anything you you would like to share. Sure, um, maybe this would be the opportunity just to see if any of the contributors from Hellas are still on the call, and they'd just like to offer some observations about the um, uh, the project. There, as I say, it was a virtual project. I I I was operating remotely with the the contributors in that location. So if if anyone is from the, the contributors in Athens is on the call. Please do raise a, a hand and, and Juan can unmute you. Not um just one just one general observation to that point um was um 
in terms of the capability, yeah, I think pretty much everyone on this call probably has has a capability to to, to record um, industrial architecture just because of the the power that's in the hands of most people's mobile device that um, certainly some of the techniques that you you saw on that film, although it was filmed via drone for the majority of shots, um, there were some handheld shots in there um, and it's worth exploring and experimenting with um, the capabilities that are actually on your your phone. One, one particular technique that I do want to just specifically mention is the color inversion technique, because I do think that's very valuable for industrial archaeology and industrial architecture. Um, every color has an inverse twin. Um, so in, in the world of analog film processing, you used to have a color negative. Um, so what you saw on screen in some shots was it was the digital version of that inversion process. And what it does do is it really it creates a pseudo three dimensional effect, almost like an X-ray, but it's it's a diff it's different, but it has this effect of really pulling out steelwork, brickwork, um, even road structures. So you get this duality view. So you can you can see some industrial architecture in the regular view, but then you can invert it um, and it gives you a, a complementary perspective. So I would thoroughly recommend you'll have one. You'll I can guarantee you on your mobile phone, you will have a color inversion filter. So if you if you take a photo or a film of a piece of industrial architecture, why not experiment and uh, hit the hit the color inversion button and, and see what happens? OK, thank you very much, uh, Gordon, for uh, the suggestions of uh, how to uh, make more creative things uh, out of uh, the architecture of industry or uh, industrial heritage. Um, there is another question by MH. It's not direct. It's not directed to any speaker in particular. Uh, he says, uh, "How do uh, or she says how do industrial architecture source fund?" for maintenance and operating a museum in a long term uh, that can be costly. Any comments, anybody to these uh, questions, to this question? It's not my field sorry. of expertise, so sorry, I, I I don't know how to answer that, that question. Yeah, sure. Sorry. <laughs> sure. No problem. I mean, I, I, I'm a volunteer of a museum. I can't speak for the, the trustees of the museum, but in, in that particular context, it's it's um, the, the museum in, in Cambridge has been volunteer led, as I say, for, for, for 50 years. Um, but it's a combination of of staffing yeah um professional staff and and volunteers and and the funding comes through a number of sources in that case again it's difficult to generalize beyond um that 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 case in 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 the case of the the museum it's a combination of of income from from tickets funding sources through uh, you know national um funding organizations um and contributions from 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 volunteers Okay, good. Thank you very much, uh, Gordon, for your uh, answer. Um, I think uh, we can leave it here today, uh, but uh, before we go, I would like to make an announcement. I just posted on the chat facility uh, that uh, the Association for Industrial Archaeology is going to open a new series of uh, workshops, a new series of uh, CPD, uh, Continued Professional Development, uh, more oriented, well, actually to anybody interested uh, in the industrial past. Uh, the first one is going to be in January, in a pair of months, and it's going to feature uh, Jeffrey Wallis from the Association of Industrial Archaeology and Dorothea Restoration, uh, who will teach uh, whoever wants to join about how to take care, how to restore and conserve cast and iron uh, works. Also, uh, as you know, we will have a new edition of these East-West uh, workshops on industrial archaeology next May, uh, May 2023. So I hope to see all of you uh, then. 
Uh, thank you again very much to uh, Carolina, uh, Stanley, and Gordon. I think your presentations have been absolutely amazing. I also have some questions, but I, I will talk to you later uh, in order to uh, keep the workshops in two hours. And thank you also very much to all the people that joined it today from, I would say, almost every continent. And thanks to uh, the institutions supporting this activity and to Bill for taking care of all the technical parts. So it was very nice to see you. Uh, have a nice Saturday, uh, Saturday morning, afternoon or evening, depending when you are. And hope to see you soon uh, on January and also on May. So thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Thanks. My bye pleasure. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Thank you, Julian. Yeah. Thank See you, you later. Much. Okay. See bye. you later. Bye. Bye bye.